Welcome! This is Political Aphasia. You know, it feels like the prime thing is to start with a list of reasons why you shouldn't trust me. Now, number one, I might be college educated, but my degree is not in the topics that I am about to discuss. Two, I'm fairly timid in person and tend to keep to myself. So basically, any social commentary I'm making is from an outside observation, at least so far as you can be outside. 3. My perspective is likely one that you've seen here several times already on YouTube, but I decided to do this anyway. Why? Eh, I felt like it. 4. I could be wrong. Anything that I say can and should be questioned. I'm not an expert on this. I'm just a guy that passively absorbs a lot of crap and occasionally needs to dump some of this. That's why, where possible, I'm going to link to books and sources in the doobly-doo that helped inform my views. 5. You barely know me. Why are you looking to a random dude on the internet to tell you how to think about things like this? If you don't find what I have to say compelling, then you do not have to engage. And finally, six, I have this weird side panel thing that keeps saying snarky shit and undercutting me in my points. We good? Good. Let's begin. The Colbert Report has been off the air for a while now, hasn't it? Weird segue, I know, but I've got a point to make. I remember when he first coined truthiness. That's when your truth comes from first instinct, without stopping to consider things like facts or research. He coined that term to talk about the way George W. played hard and fast with the facts. <laughs> His show was, like the daily show that it spun off from, a satirical take on the news. It reported on actual events, but it always had a tongue-in-cheek take. Stephen Colbert's character of Stephen Colbert was a neocon and a staunch Bush supporter. His style was typically to state things how they were, state the contradictory evidence as though he was incredulous of it, and then affirm the conservative point in a way that ridiculed it to his audience. It was, quite honestly, a lot of fun. The show was based on the O'Reilly Factor, and Colbert styled himself after O'Reilly's punditry. I personally remember loving the show while it was on. The Daily Show and The Colbert Report, despite Jon Stewart's warnings against this, formed a lot of my political opinions while I was developing politically. Now, to those that already agreed that the contradictory evidence could be dismissed then, and I thought something else about Colbert. He was just a funny man, speaking truth to power. No, wait, hang on, that's not... He's making fun of you for doing that, you can't... No, that's against the rules. You can't just claim him as your ally. He's mocking you for doing that. But did it, they did. And Fox knew exactly what he was doing and how to use it to their advantage. O'Reilly debated and conversed with him several times until Colbert was eventually tapped to replace David Letterman. Many from the Fox audience thought Colbert was merely pretending to not be right-wing, and despite him repeatedly admitting that he was playing a character... Why would they think that? The answer lies in truthiness. Now, truthiness itself, I believe, plays at the heart of social media. It's evolved these days into alternative facts and fake news. But I dislike those, so I'm sticking with the term truthiness. Now, the style of so-called rationalists deals in truthiness, given how often BreadTube debunks them. As Ian Danskin put it in this video, The Card Says Moops, they treat rationality as an innate quality that one either possesses or lacks, where <clears throat> what you say is treated as true because, that because that's what you feel is true, as opposed to a methodology where you evaluate facts and then form beliefs, and then form arguments from those facts to defend those beliefs. Now, I'm going to make a vastly overgenerous statement here, but I believe that at some point in time, the majority of people, probably more than 90%, have argued from a deeply personal truthiness. It's that feeling when you're sure that you remember hearing somebody mentioning something maybe tangentially about what you're talking about, or connecting two points from videos about things that maybe shouldn't have been connected, or even 
You know, I could Google search this if I wanted to, but I already read the article three times and the accompanying video five times, so I'm not gonna bother. Now, obviously, me doing this video anytime that I'm drawing non-objective conclusions is going to use some measure of truthiness, simply due to how muddled fact and opinion can get about certain topics, especially philosophical ones. Me quoting a philosophy tuber wisecrack video about the lack of objectivity from a personal perspective is not going to convince you that my conclusions are right or wrong. What really matters at this moment right now is if you already agree with me. That's kind of the problem, isn't it? Now, to preface what I'm about to say, this section is not about a problem. It's about the way that ideas and information propagate and the problems created by certain specific propagations. Think of it like talking about fluid dynamics versus explosions. Now, I feel that thinking about information like this will navigate conversations about why certain things coming up frequently is bad. Even if it doesn't end up being 100% accurate, it's at least a framework to it begin considering things from. This field of study is imprecise basically for the same reason that people are, so talking about this is going to get into some muddy territory. I'm going to be referencing a lot of sources during this. I'm telling you this because the supporting points of my thesis end up adjacent to those sources, usually offering this as an explanation for why it happens, or else being exactly the point. To begin, there's a phenomenon called priming in psychology. If a concept is processed by the brain, be it by reading, hearing, seeing, smelling, or feeling, a bunch of related concepts are then primed so that your brain forms a kind of web of information. This web forms a schema. You'll more th quickly think of related words, and if that schema includes emotions and your made to relate the, uh, that schema to yourself, you'll tend to feel those emotions. Similarly, if a schema is invoked and then linked to somebody else, you'll tend to project the emotions related to it onto them. Now, research on behavioral priming itself is difficult to replicate, but it's enough of a phenomenon that people pay attention to it, and multi-million dollar companies pay good money to spitball on how to prime people. So. We're going to be using priming as our frame today. So understanding priming won't explain everything, but it can be a useful tool when considering how to criticize something based on social good or harm. I'm colossally unconcerned with using cutting edge or research intensive terminology. What you generally need to know is that priming is associated with a few contested phenomena. These range from forming opinions on somebody based on the beverage you're currently holding, to which words you come to faster based on if you think a white coat is a lab coat or a smock and you're wearing it. Even to having some stereotypes enforced because you reminded somebody which abilities your stereotype has or does not have. Now this can apply to actions as well, let's use Benjamin Franklin as an example. He used to get colleagues that disliked or even hated him to treat him better over time by basically asking them to do favors for him, such as lending him a book. The theory in this case is that doing good things for somebody makes you feel more like they were a person that you liked, as opposed to doing good things for a person because you liked them. As such, people's beliefs are molded by their actions as much as their actions are molded by their beliefs. Your own actions help mold the schema of yourself that you keep within you, though you'll embody different schemas depending on the social context. But getting somebody to do something will mold their schema of themselves to include that action in the context that they're currently in, and it will change their perceived schema of you in that context. Another thing that's been found is that the negative examples that run counter to a schema are easier to recall, but that the schema is assumed to be true unless you manage to deconstruct and rebuild it. Your personal schema of somebody being generally nice means it's difficult to recall actual examples of that person being nice, but them being rude is easier to recall. This is why the first impression is so important, because it forms the schema that a person will default to every time that they are exposed to the concept of you. But that schema can be altered by priming. 
Schemas are like memories and can be colored by your emotions in the moments of recall, as much as recalling them can affect your emotions. Confirmation bias comes into play here. It's easy to recall schemas where somebody deviated from their schema, but you're more likely to notice instances where they play into it at the moment, so that they, unless they fall so far outside that it's actually very jarring. Now, your version of a schema is going to be unique to your own life's experiences. It might be similar to your in-group schemas, but each one is going to have different life experiences that built it. So, when you invoke a schema, you will need to know your audience and how they'll generally react to it. Your understanding of a schema and your understanding of how the culture at large understands a schema are all part of the same definition. You don't really know what the public at large is actually thinking about something. But once a schema has been formed and propagated, you can be somewhat certain that most people will have assumptions about what you're talking about, even if they disagree with your position. Oh, and one last thing. These schemas are the source of stereotypes, tropes, and really any recognizable pattern that you see in media and in real life. They're your brain's shorthand, a generic template in which to make sense of the world in as efficient way as possible. The phenomenon is neutral, but it does mean that your brain is going to return knee-jerk to the schemas that it's already got when it doesn't understand something right away. So, in the case of the Colbert Report, the type of satire that he produced was still calling conservative right-wing schemas into play. For the target demographic to watch and laugh at the spectacle of conservative punditage as portrayed by Colbert, because those liberal centrists and yes, even lefties already had the schema that let them dismiss and lampoon the other. But for quite a while, a number of conservatives didn't know Stevens' actual political positions, or that the Colbert Report was supposed to be satire. Confirmation bias assured them that any mockery that they felt was just him playing an act. They felt that he was bringing up counterpoints to show that they were just as irrelevant as his character believed them to be. Probably because they also thought those counterarguments could be dismissed as simply as the important man on TV just did. Although, this might be my own truthiness coming through again. So, when you invoke these schemas for the sake of satire, you need to shake them free of the holders of that schema and include uh, things that are considered almost universally negative and attach them to them. If you fail to make it clear that the schema that you are invoking is reprehensible, you're only going to reinforce it. They can't rely on a gotcha once they leave the theater, or if they think about the implications of the satire a decade later. Here's looking at you, Paul Verhoeven. Now, it needs to be immediate and visceral. PBS Idea Stream has an excellent video on the morality of social commentary as it relates to this idea. Please follow the link up here. So, when Stephen invokes those conservative schemas and doesn't consistently try to shake their definitions, he's recalling them and then priming those related connections and emotions. Even the ones you know that other people know, but you wish that they didn't. And that reinforces them. Even if you're laughing at the use of those schemas in that way, you still reinforce them, even just by talking about them. The comedy. You know the ones that I'm talking about. By refusing to say something, to correct a misconception, and instead just pointing and laughing, you just reinforce it. I want to say this again for the nosebleed seats. You have to pump the comedy breaks to show how a schema isn't accurate before you make your own joke. It doesn't just get done on its own by making the character a dunce. Bringing it up at all only reinforces it. The character being an asshole is a fluke that sticks out, but it doesn't contramand the schema. At worst, they'll just call it bad representation. Think about how most domestic terrorism in the U.S. is done by white conservative set, set males who have a history of domestic violence, but our collective idea of terrorism does not reflect that fact. I say terrorist, you think of someone else. The given choice of words with which you associate any given schema will both reveal your definition of that schema and either help form or reinforce others with what you just primed them to believe. 
such as choosing to say that violence has occurred after a police officer has shot an innocent person, and not when, or that black people are looting while white people are scavenging, even though they're doing the same thing. Knowing about this now, you could even purposefully try and force an association, forming your own schema and just blasting it out there until everyone knows what you're talking about, even if they don't want to. And it's impossible to discuss what you've just done without reinforcing that. Here, Gillette's using the schema it has been selling the best a man can get, and then relating that schema to the social consciousness about discussions of toxic masculinity. By making this tie, if it is reinforced enough, anytime you bring up the discussion of toxic masculinity, you are then primed to think of their razors. That's regardless of your feelings about the whole toxic tay masculinity main subject. Some people might denounce Gillette's dastardly plot, but Gillette is banking that tying their brand to positive discussions about toxic masculinity will result in more people hearing about their razor and having a positive or at least neutral association rather than a negative one. The controversy surrounding the issue reinforces it every time that it has been brought back into the discussion. So, when someone is arguing from truthiness, it is through their truth context. They are arguing the schema, either restating what their schemas are, or trying to influence what other schemas are defined as, either consciously or subconsciously. Perception isn't truth, but it is often perceived as it, and that makes it true enough. If something is true, but it doesn't match pre-constructed schemas, people will instinctively defend the schema rather than redefine it. This is the exact same process as defending a schema from a lie. It doesn't match your schematic truth, so there has to be a rational explanation for why the two don't match. And this is why the person who gets to arbitrate the truth of the schema has so much power, and why people jockey for this position. Schemas, both cultural and personal, have a lot of inertia, so most often, they only slowly change. Illuminating schema so that they can be debunked, rebuilt, or otherwise corrected is even slower. Schemas are not what you say that you believe, keep in mind. They are what you are most apt to believe in the heat of the moment, because they are your mind's quick and easy templates to predict behavior. And if you match somebody's schema of their outgroup, the other, then they are far more likely to just reject your opinions. A lot of logical fallacies and named effects are based on this kind of thing. You know, I actually have a plan for a video about the logic behind them. Now, using the same jargon as somebody else will often identify you as being part of their in-group. Uh, in other words, if you want to convince somebody of uh, something, uh, you have to be willing and able to meet them where they're at. Unfortunately, if where they are at is using slurs casually, then harshly rejecting their use of those slurs will immediately identify you as outgroup, and your response will likely offend them, and you will then lose the opportunity to reach out to that person if you don't already have other connections with them to fall back on. So what do you do? It's a hard to walk that tightrope. Somebody don't bother, and I don't blame them. Now, on social media, what are traditionally called memes are often just an image that comes to outline a very simple schema. It's summary, really. People use those schemas to represent their ideas on top of the meme. There isn't room for a nuance of discussion in memes, and these memes will be the first point of contact in the discussion thread, so they'll often form a newcomer's first opinion on a topic. These memes are just there to form or strengthen somebody's existing schemas. Um, creating them self-validates your own existing schemas, posting them signals that you hold them, reading them strengthens or forms them. They're so short that all they can be used for is honestly, um, 
to form or strengthen somebody's schemas on a subject. I personally don't like them as anything more than a form of self-care, just a way to be able to quickly share your thoughts with friends. All that memes are is a form of catchphrase, especially political memes. Something quick and snappy, almost like a joke and a punchline, all rolled up into one image. Though a, a meme is not necessarily a joke, it's merely an idea, compressed. Or rather, it, it carries an idea, but it isn't really persuasive on its own. You can agree with its premise, or you don't. It's almost pure confirmation bias. And oh boy, that dopamine hit sure feels good when those likes pile in on your pithy statement that was almost definitely stolen from another meme. So, just a quick recap. One, basically any concept that you can think of has a web of connected information that I'm calling a schema. We're calling one of these webs of ideas will then prime you to think about the other items in the web. Three, forming a set of connections is easier than changing them due to confirmation bias. Four, bringing up a concept without trying to make the new connections or degrade existing ones will instead reinforce the schema in which the concept is being held. Now, points three and four will lead us to the last real point. This is the most important one. Including the already charged definition in your debunk video and attempting to recontextualize it still allows confirmation bias to take hold because of this. People will see what they want to see. Making your point using novel forms forces them to engage with your ideas. When you do this, the schema that they hold for you in that context will be what the new schema then buds from, and as such, you will be the touchstone of that schema. But even including the point that you need to debunk before the schema can be formed will allow confirmation bias to take hold. Simply using the familiar term will prime your audience to hear the old schema and everything associated with it. Schemas can cause emotional override, so if the terminology that you're using is blanketed over them, you'll have to handle with care as using those terms in their clinically tested form will signal that you belong to the bad schema, thereby priming the associated emotions against you. The magnitude can be strikingly different between any two people. Using these charged terms alone merely serves as a flag to allow people to sort you. All of your intentions are now assumed, your actions colored by the terminology that you just used. The only way around this is to effectively invent your own language, or to describe what you want to describe in the blandest terminology possible, but not so bland that you're using big words that are hard to understand, because that's also flagging you as being part of a certain schema. Language is a powerful mechanism to carry your messages, but the mere act of attempting communication will itself communicate something to your audience. The ideas that your words carry will influence how they perceive you, the way you dress, the way you talk, the color of your skin, the place that you choose to do that communication in. All of these will prime emotions that will make certain schemas easier or harder to recall. This overall is an idea that will likely feel obvious once pointed out, but you never really think about the implication. Whoa! 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 Can you not? I don't want this video to get mass flagged before I even get off the ground. Yeah, yeah, I get it. It's important for sure, but the more specific you get in your language, the smaller your audience is. Just mentioning that is going to cause a stir. Can, can, can we please change the topic? Ripping off? No, 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 no. This is a tangential topic. None of them really talk about this aspect of about how ideas propagate. <sighs> yep. Yep, really cutting deep there. So yeah, this is a really important discussion to have. 
Citing a video as inspiration is tying that video to yours, and it elevates it in the eyes of somebody else using these techniques. But I mean, do you want me to not talk about a relevant tangential topic? And do you think that using the word meme or memetics is any better? That word's been polluted beyond comprehension, and you know it. <sighs> right. Yep. I, I guess so now we have to talk about it. Yep. Fine. So, ContraPoints and Ian Dance can go over this and a lot of... Oh, will you... Fuck off! Anyway, so ContraPoints and Ian Dance can go over this in a lot of detail, about how ideas are often hidden in coded language, usually tying a less savior idea to a more neutral sounding language. That's because the people doing this know what emotions the schema of their held ideas elicit, so they're trying to smuggle their ideas in using language similar to what the left is trying to use. They change their terminology to try and bring over more people and hope that by the time that people know what the words actually mean, they've identified that group as their in-group, or at the very least their experts, and won't reject the real meaning of those words. They'll regularly propagate ideas that will help define and reinforce their own schemas. Uh, <clears throat> that will help reinforce their own schemas when brought up to be debunked. And that's why it's important to state your ideas first, if you mention theirs at all. Your truth has to be so self-evident and pithy in truth, so reducible to sound bites, to memes, that by the time they realize their old schema was wrong, you've already moved on to another topic. If you have to bring up their version of the schema at all, you have to have already claimed all of the territory that it needs to survive, leaving it in its negated form. Now they're going to regularly latch onto the platform of anyone with any size audience, but especially experts, and shows that have experts. They'll use the fact that they're being debated with at all to imply that their ideas are on equal footing. So overall, this treatise on the nature of schema is a reflection of how careful we must be in our language. The Colbert Report's entire concept was to make satire about programs like the O'Reilly Factor, but in doing so, he only platformed the same ideas, but just in a more ridiculous fashion. To those that already felt those types of programs were silly or even harmful, they found Colbert's take entertaining. Well, I mean, at least I know I did. But without some kind of narrative rug pull to show that the Colbert's character was inherently wrong, Rather than trusting on the viewer's perspective to confirm that they're ridiculous, you end up affirming both people that think it's ridiculous, as well as people that unironically agree with Colbert, and think that he's just exaggerating what they already think, because he agrees. So, what does this say about how we treat our character archetypes? Well, it means that any time that you're presenting an idea, you're either making an assumption about your audience, or you need to put in the work to help the audience feel something unschematic about that character. If you don't, their own biases will be put into the interpretation of that character. They'll fill in the blanks with their own experiences. Similarly, let's say that you insert a character you intend to coin as a villain, or at the very least, uh, somebody to not root for. But all you do is, for example, make them a misogynist or, or a racist. But you don't demonstrate that there's physical violence to pair with their political violence, that there's a, an effect to their words. If you just assume that somebody knows that, and then you punish that character without making it clear that it is for the reprehensible ideologies and for the behavior, well then, somebody that already acts in casually bigoted ways. To them, you're not telling them that the ways that you're acting at are harmful or bad. You're just punishing somebody who seemed pretty okay to them. You're forming a character with the presumption that your audience shares your ideas. And then if you show those things not being punished or even addressed, 
you're creating a narrative that this kind of thing is okay to tolerate or should be tolerated. In isolation, this kind of thing might be fine, or at the very least, it won't cause any damage by itself. But it's the culmination of so many other schema supporting it that helps form our own schema clear enough that it can be immediately recognized. Cultural schema. A meme. Ideas are power, and languages give us the ability to communicate these ideas and bring them to light. But if we're not careful, we can accidentally reinforce ideas that should be left well enough alone. Oh, and this thing right here? It's not real. I mean, I know that you know that, but I've been writing for it this whole time. Uh, by using the language of cinema, even if you know intellectually that this thing is a fictional entity, it feels authentic, like it has motivations and thoughts. It dances to my tune, much like a puppet. <laughs> hey, let me know what I should call the fake graphics operator in the comments. I couldn't even be bothered to make up a name. You know, I, I bet you would have signed a voice to it. Even subconsciously, you put mannerisms in place for the language that I use. But they weren't necessarily there. You filled in the blanks. That version of it is yours. I used your schema to assign it a voice in your head. And if you're doing that for this, then what else have you been doing for that in real life? I mean, even I'm not authentic. I pre-wrote this script. But I've been doing my best to sound authentic. I probably made a few flubs. Hell, I accidentally put on my announcer voice for the whole thing, but I'm not going to re-record it just for that. I'm going to re-record it because of audio bugs that I've been fixing multiple times. And <laughs> I had people look over the script to make sure that my points are well constructed and that I don't end up rambling too badly. Just rambling enough to be kind of normal sounding. This is all made up. I'm constructing this piece of media for you to enjoy, which means that any decisions to show or hide aspects are entirely my decision and reflect my worldview as a result. I use various phrases at the beginning and throughout this video, phrases that are basically cultural memes at this point, using them primed you to feel an emotion. Which emotion that is, who's to say? At this point, it almost entirely depends on if you're the kind of person to call a person a cuck, ironically, unironically, or not at all. But if you continue watching this video and get all the way here to the end and found yourself agreeing with anything that I had to say, I really hope this helped you realize. Maybe Anita Sarkeesian had a point after all. Hey, it's me. Uh taken off the the announcer voice hey uh just wanted to thank you for listening to the video i've been working on this uh, i recorded this back in may so i've been editing editing this on and off for a bit uh special thanks to pamphleteer who um went over my script and did some editing work on it um special thanks to uh, lots of people from some of the Patreon Discord communities that I participate in. They had a lot of input on this. Um, if you want to see more like this, feel free to like and subscribe. I'm sorry for some of the audio errors that were going on throughout the video. Um, I'm... I have a few ideas for how I'm going to fix some of those. Number one is making sure that my microphone levels are actually good before I start recording. I met, I checked them and then I messed with them and it messed everything up and I needed to... Ugh, it was just... I didn't want to have to do another take. So I tried to work with what I got and maybe I should have done another take. But yeah... Um, thanks for listening. Like and subscribe. Uh, if you want to donate, you know, because you, you like me that much, you want to throw money at me, I don't know why you would, um, then go ahead and uh, donate to my uh, coffee. I don't know if I'm going to have enough content, re you know, regular content for a Patreon yet, so that's why it's just the coffee down there in the doobly-doo. Have a great day. Bye.